Okay, uh, let's get started. So today I'm going to cover sort of a grab bag of topics. Um, going to basically cover some chap some parts of the probability chapter. So we'll start with Gaussian random variables, mainly because we'll use the notion of a Gaussian noise when doing information theory. A couple of important uh, theorems which I won't prove. The proof of the central limit theorem is actually in the book, but uh, these are interesting results with respect to probability and uh, the strong law of large numbers again shows up in information theory in a different form. It's called information theory, it's called the asymptotic equipartition property and so I'll go with this because then from there the AEP will become much clearer. Uh, and then I'll talk about joint distributions and uh, if there is time I'll do something on Bayesian networks though the treatment of Bayesian networks I have is really, really limited and actually has one confusion in it, not a mistake per se, but it's a confusing, confusing part, but I'll come to that. Okay, so let me start with the Gaussian random variable. Uh, Gaussian random variable or the normal distribution Uh, it's the, uh, it's a, a random variable, it's, it's a continuous random variable and it has a kind of a interesting history uh, which is worth knowing. So it started out, Gauss was uh, of course a great mathematician uh, but he also you know had some access to experimental data and he found that the errors that people were making in correcting experimental results had some variations which, which followed a particular distribution which is in this case which, which became the Gaussian distribution. And uh, these are actually astronomical data, you know, so people when you're taking samples of stars or transit times of how long does it take for, for you know, the, uh, a star to be seen from one side of the moon to the other side of the moon, it's some time duration, right? And so uh, you can measure this time and people would make mistakes on that and the errors would follow some distribution. Um, about 100 and 130 years ago, uh, there, was a, there was a statistician who was empl employed in Belgium. I forget his name right now, he's a Belgian statistician. And he started looking at uh, uh, populations, statistics of populations of you know, different things. You know, what were their weights, what were their heights, what kind of food did they eat, what kind of crops were grown. And wherever he looked, he saw Gaussian distributions, <laughs> okay. So this notion of population statistics and even actually a lot of modern statistical theory comes from this one, uh, one guy, you know, I, I wish I could remember his name. Uh, he's not very well known, uh, it's certainly not as famous as Gauss, but uh, essentially this, uh, the reason why there is, uh, you know, in Canada we have StatsCan, Statistics Canada, and it's a, uh, it's a big department which has a lot of money and a lot of efforts because of people like him who, who are basically trying to uh, associate statistics and see the changes in statistics lead to, uh, lead to uh, predictions about certain things. And if you have crop failures, then maybe it's due to weather or something. Uh, I see we have a very important uh, text message or something right here in the front row. Uh, is it something super important? Would you like to share it with the class? Or would you like to leave? What do you want to do? If you want to do your text messaging, don't sit in the front row. Okay, sit outside. Is that clear? I made this point before. I don't want to make it again. Okay. So, in many cases, we find that the normal distribution shows up. Okay, and actually there's a reason for it, and the reason is the central limit theorem but the, it shows up basically when you have many small and independent sources of errors. So all three must be true. So you have to have, if you have just one source of error, 
then you know you, you don't get this uh, balancing around a central point. If you have, if they're not small, again you can have one error throw you off, and if they're if not independent, again you can have correlations, right? But if you have many small independent, then what happens is that you know this is like a trembling hand. You want to make a point, a dot over here, but your hand trembles. There's many small independent things, and you go here, you go there, you go there, but it's not you know, but it has a distribution which idealized looks like this. Okay, we have some central point, which is where we really want to be, but in fact the variations are going to be uh, spread out around that central point, and that's typically what would be happening. Let's say you're doing a, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you, you, I'm, I'm sure all of you have done these chemistry experiments where you're supposed to measure, you know, how many mL of reagent you add to something else before it turns pink or green or explodes or whatever it is. Um, and everybody in the class will get a slightly different value, but if you were to plot it, you get this uh, classic bell-shaped curve. That's because each person uh, is, is uh, making a small independent error. You're not necessarily influenced by each other, and the many of them. So when these sorts of errors are averaged out, you essentially get this over here. Okay, so more formally, the, the, this is the mean point over here. And the spread, how, you know, because we can imagine that we could have a curve that looks like that as well. Okay, or you can look at something that looks narrower. So this spread, which is basically how far away we are, is captured by another parameter, which is sigma. Mu, mu is the mean, that's where you are. Sigma is basically how wide it is. And the equation, and the density function is given by fx. This is the density, not the cumulative. It's given by 1 upon sigma square root 2 pi. Uh, oops, sorry, what am I putting? E to the minus. Uh, so I should use small x, x minus mu by sigma square. Okay, and if you ignore sort of most of the, the most of the crowd, it's really something like e to the minus x square. Okay, that's really what you're talking about. Okay, all the other stuff is basically normalization constants. We need to put in one upon sigma root two pi because otherwise it doesn't sum up to one from minus infinity to infinity. So that's just a normalization constant. It has really no deep significance. And this x minus mu or sigma, x minus mu basically says I'm going to look at variations about the mean, around the mean rather than around zero. Okay, so x, uh, x has got some value. So zero may be somewhere over here. But x minus mu is, is basically variations around mu. Okay, so we get x minus mu from there. And then that's just, again, normalizing with respect to sigma. So really, what we're looking at is something like, like this. Again, the half is uh, not, 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 not critical. And uh, uh, so we are looking at something like an exponential distribution, except that instead of using e to the minus x, using e to the minus x squared, which makes it symmetric. Okay. It looks like it's, it's symmetric, and it's symmetric around mu. So to take an example, I mean, if I were to take e to the x, you know, e to the x, as we know, kind of goes like this, right? But if you take this part away, okay, then uh, e to the x in both, the, if, you know, e to the mod x looks something like this. And if you take x squared, okay, we get uh, <laughs> and a minus, okay, minus puts it going down like that, right? e to the minus it's going to go like this. And then uh, if you square it, we get sort of this curve. So I mean, I'm just giving you sort of a seat of the pants explanation of how we get from e to the x to the e to the half minus half x squared. Um, but that's basically what the normal distribution looks like. And at first glance, it looks a bit complicated, but really it isn't. Okay. All right. So we didn't, the notation we use is that the random variable x, capital X, is we use this tilde sign is uh, <coughs> sorry mu sigma square, this means that x is distributed normally n with parameter mu and sigma square, because it's two parameters, mu and sigma square. Sigma square is the variance, or sigma is the standard deviation. And, um, and this, is, this, is the, uh, this is what we uh, denoted by. For the particular case where x is distributed as 0, 1, we call this the standard normal. And this means that it has a mean of zero, so it's this, this value right here is going to be zero, and then the, the, the standard deviation is one. Okay, so that's the standard normal uh, distribution. Okay. 
Now, we should remember that this normal distribution, although it looks quite nice, etc., has a couple of uh, underlying assumptions. Okay? One of them, I already told you, the errors have to be many, small, and independent. We often assume that the noise that we hear on a channel or something like that is Gaussian, which means that there's no, uh, you know, it's no independent, uh, there's no memory, okay? The, the noise variables are independent of each other. Uh, if, they are, uh, if there are correlations in these sources, okay, then you'll find that Gaussian is not a good way to model it, okay? So we have to be careful about that. The second thing that actually makes a difference, which, which people do not really uh, think carefully about, is to realize that the support of the Gaussian distribution is actually minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay, in other words, the Gaussian is not confined to some range over here, it goes all the way here. So there's a non-zero probability that it's any value, including minus infinity, okay, any, any very, very positive, very negative values. So when we say that we model the heights of people with a Gaussian distribution, it's not quite right. <coughs> okay, well, because you can't have a negative height, right? But the Gaussian distribution goes to negative infinity, right? So, so whenever we have a quantity which is known to be positive, right, or known to be negative for that matter, and we model it with the Gaussian distribution, what's going to happen is that we're going to be making some mistake because we certainly we have a sharp cutoff at zero, but the Gaussian goes to minus infinity. So we have to kind of worry about this case and typically what we do is that we rely on the fact that the Gaussian distribution has some very well-known uh, uh, spreads. So the spread that we have is plus minus, so mu, so the, the probability that the variable x lies in the range mu minus sigma to mu plus sigma, okay, and it is, is, uh, is about 68%. And then if it go, the probability that it lies in mu minus two sigma, mu plus two sigma, is approximately equal to 95%. And then we have probability that it lies in plus minus three sigma. Okay, that one is going to be approximately 99%. So if we know that a particular random variable is Gaussian distributed for sure, okay, or if you're modeling it as such, okay, we know that less than 1% lies plus, plus minus 3 sigma. And because it lies plus minus 3 sigma, if this lies over here is, let's say, mu minus 6 sigma, okay, then the probability mass that lies to the left over here is so small that for practical purposes we can ignore it, okay. But we are, uh, it's, it's an approximation, okay. And this is where kind of the math and engineering or math and practice uh, are, are going to be different. Okay. In the case of the, uh, mathematically speaking, we have non-zero probability. And if one were to try and um, create, generate random variables from the Gaussian, which you well might do, you will end up sometimes with negative numbers. You know? So you have to be very careful that when you're doing simulations or any kind of analysis, you have to exclude those values. And if you do this, uh, over here, then one time out of 100, okay, if it's three sigma, then one time out of 100, uh, or actually half time out of 100, because it's bimodal, you know, it's bidirectional, we're going to get this problem. One time in 200, you're going to have a negative value, okay? And so you have to exclude it, okay? And, and if you don't, you're going to get into trouble. So be careful when you're using Gaussian approximations that the spread uh, doesn't go into negative infinity. Okay. Um, this sigma value plus minus sigma, it gives, it because it's, if, if something is approximated as a Gaussian random variable, this gives us some good confidence that, you know, what is the probability mass lie, okay? And uh, so we hear about, if, how many of you heard about six sigma processes in, in, in the industry? How many of you heard about the six sigma? Okay, a few of you heard of six sigma. So do you know what it is? What, do you, what is it? It's just a buzzword. Did you say you heard about it? Quality, yeah. Sigma, yeah. Right, so the Six Sigma process, as I understand it, is that the error should happen very rarely, okay? So you want all the processes to be such that you're basically 
uh, very unlikely to go, you know, into uh, make a mistake. Okay, and so there, that six sigma really re refers to the number of standard deviations away from the mean that you are in uh, in, in in assuming it's a Gaussian random variable. Okay, uh, <laughs> so so this is again entered common common parlance, I guess. I just want to give you a few facts about the Gaussian, and then we'll take a break. Uh, so these, these can all be proved using moment generating functions, but, but we're not going to do that. So the first one has to do with, uh, so if x is distributed normally uh, and with mu and sigma square, then uh, a plus bx. So what's a plus bx? It's also, let's call it y. So this is another random variable, which is sort of a function of a random variable, OK? So we can view, uh, if you take x is, is something, OK, it's a continuous random, continuous random variable. We can always take the value it assumes, multiply it by b, add a to it, and we get another random variable, y. So we want to know what is the distribution of y given that x is distributed like this. But it turns out that this one, y, has a distribution which is also normal. And it's going to be a plus b mu. And then the uh, standard division is going to be b squared, sigma squared. And it's worth looking at it for just a moment. What's going on is that the central point mu is going to obviously be multiplied by b and shifted by a. So obviously, uh, y is going to have a set different mean. The mean is going to be a plus b mu. But the standard deviation uh, is multiplied not by b, but by b squared. Okay, and that's the way it works out. It's not going to be b sigma square, but b square sigma square. So if you take a Gaussian random variable, and we were to multiply it by some value b, ignore a for a moment, we just multiply it by b, then the multiplication of the random variable actually is going to make the variance go up, okay, uh, by, by factor of b square. Okay, so in, in this case, we are actually multiplying a b square rather than b. So multiplying actually has a, in some sense, a exaggerates the, the variability of the, uh, of the random variable. Okay, so that's a sort of an interesting fact. The, the second one is essentially the trick for converting from a, uh, from a non-standard random variable to a standard random variable. So if x is normally distributed with mu sigma square, then the variable y, which is equal to x minus mu over sigma, is going to be normal. It's just going to be not distributed normally zero one. Okay, and you can you can just show this by substituting over here. Um, and so what happens over here is that you can basically take any random variable and find the corresponding standard variable. And so for this reason, when we when we are going to uh, give tables. We usually just give tables for standard normal variable. And I think the homework problem was just a trivial use of this. So I said over there, uh, assume that x is normally distributed with the parameters 5, 4. So this is mu. This is sigma square. So sigma is equal to 2. And so the uh, this standard normal variable is going to be what? Uh, Five, five, sorry, uh, x minus five over two, and then it's going to be uh, one. So x minus mu over sigma, uh, one. So the corresponding standard normal variable is going to be this. Okay, so it's going to be z is going to be. Yeah, what am I doing over here? <laughs> sorry, uh, z is going to be normally distributed. And the parameters are uh, uh, <laughs> 0 and 1, where z equals x minus mu, x minus 5 over 2. OK, sorry. OK, so that's basically what I'm trying to. The only trick here was it's uh, sigma square in the in, 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 in the normal definition we, we say the sigma square not sigma so sig it's two it's not uh, it's not four okay that's basically all there is true 
Uh, okay, I think I'm just going to get started. Okay, so I'm going to start with the central limit theorem. Uh, we won't see this in the information theory, but uh, it's kind of a, a very, very important application of probability when you go into statistics. It's basically uh, almost everything is based on the central limit theorem. So it's kind of foundational theorem. So let me just tell you what the statement is. So we have a large number of uh, independent uh, random variables, okay? And you're going to label them as x1, x2, etc., until xn, so, and, and n tends to infinity, so everything is in the limit. So we have a, a, a large independent, and we have the, the xi have arbitrary they're arbitrarily distributed. But they are identical, identical distributions. Okay, so, so we have a bunch of random variables. I just have a bunch of them. Each one is independent with the identical, okay? And we often, in, in, in papers, we refer to this IID, and IID means independent, identically distributed. So that's the assumptions we're going to make over here. So those are the assumptions. And so whenever you see a paper that says IID, you know they're going to use the central limit theorem, okay? That's kind of, that's the reason why you need IID. Um, and it's small uh, in its, e each value is kind of small, and so, the, the so technique so the the mean uh, uh, actually we don't need to state that technically because it's it, what's ca going on is that we have a large number identical so if n is large enough okay then obviously the contribution of each value to the sum is going to be small right because it's going to be one over n contribution and if that happens then uh, and let's say the distribution the each mean uh, each has mean of mu and the variance of sigma square, okay? Then the distribution of the sum, then, the normalized sum is defined to be this, normal normalized sum is defined as x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus xn, this minus n mu, so you're trying to get it around zero, divided by uh, sigma square root n. This normalized sum is going to be distributed normally zero, one, okay? So that's basically the, uh, that's the, that's the statement of the central limit theorem. And uh, I'm not going to prove it as I said, but I'm going to give you some idea of what, what's going on. So given that we have these independent errors in our measurement, okay, we can treat each measurement as being influenced by these errors. So we kind of think of the, uh, the, the, uh, the measurement as being the a true value plus the sum of many independent random variables, okay? And for the sake of this theorem, we're going to assume that the errors, the things that affect what value you choose are, uh, are independent, identically distributed, okay? In other words, as I said earlier, we are making these errors, but we're not making them systematically, making them independently of each other, and they all have identical uh, distributions, they all, all have an identical uh, uh, effect on the outcome, okay? So that's the assumption we're making for this, for this over here. So if we do this, then for sure we're going to get the uh, sum uh, of the normalized sum of these errors, which is essentially the, uh, what, we, what we're seeing over here, is going to be Gaussian distributed. So the mean of the normalized sum is going to be the mean of the Gaussian, which is zero. Okay, which means that these guys are going to be approximately around n mu. Or if we were to just rearrange this, 
this x1 plus x2 plus x3, the whole thing divided by n is going to look something like mu with some kind of uh, uh, spread around it. Okay. So the the uh, the way we view this in, in when we're doing statistics, and I won't go into too much detail, is that I'm going to, uh, let's say I want to measure the average height in this room. Okay, so I want to know the distribution of heights of, of grad students in, in, at Waterloo, right? So uh, I, if I could measure everybody, because that's a finite population, and I could certainly have a population I could measure everybody, uh, and then I'd know for sure. But I don't want to measure everybody. Okay, it's, it's too much work. Instead, I want to measure uh, sample. So I pick a representative sample. How do I do that? Uh, I don't know, right? I, representative could be I, I, uh, I just go into the grad house and then I pick every fifth person coming in and say, okay, that's a representative sample. Or I just pick people in this class and say, you're a representative sample. What is representative? We don't know, right? We just assume it's representative. Once we do this, if I were to take the average, that means I'm going to sum all your heights and divide it by the total number n, that's over here, then I'm going to get some average height, okay? This constitutes one sample mean. It constitutes one sample mean, okay? And that's sort of one value taken by this normalized sum random variable. So we have, a, we have, this, we have the individual heights, those are not, um, random variables, you have a specific height, you know, you don't, you don't have a probabilistic height, okay? Well, once you reach 18 or 20, your height is fixed, it's not probabilistic, you don't wake up one day and say, oh, my I'm large, you know, or my I'm small or whatever, you don't turn into cockroaches overnight unless you're in a novel by Kafka, okay? So, this is one data point in the sample. Now what I do is I pick another class, another grad class, and I do the same thing. I have, let's say, 50 people, and I take their sum, and I divide it, and I get another mean. This mean is another mean, okay? It's another sample mean. So I can do this, let's say, 50 times. So I'm going to get 50 different sample means. What the central limit theorem is telling us is that these sample means are going to be distributed like this normally, okay, and the, of course if you divide by n whatever, you're going to get uh, 0, 1 uh, Gaussian distribution, okay, but if it's not, it's going to be mu sigma square, fine, but um, the central limit theorem does not apply to the individuals, the distribution of heights is not Gaussian necessarily, it can be arbitrary, yes? No, this is, we're not assuming that's exactly, is exactly what I'm saying. Your heights could be distributed exponentially, but, you know, whatever. We don't care. But the sample means are going to be distributed Gaussian. So we can draw the picture like this. I'm going to say the first sample is going to look like this, x1. The first sample, the first element is x11 plus x12 plus x13 plus by n1, let's just say n1, so this is, the, uh, let's call that x1 bar is equal to this. Then the second sample is going to look like this, x2 bar is going to be x21 plus x22 plus, plus x2, uh, let's even say m by m, okay? And then x3 bar is going to be something like this and so on till I have xk bar, which is this whole thing over here, right? So I can even have different sample sizes, though it's not recommended, you can, and I get a bunch of these things over here, right? And as long as these m and then and so, of a, so on are relatively large, so that you have small independent errors, it doesn't matter what this distribution is. These guys over here, the x, which is, this is called the sample distribution of the mean, is going to be Gaussian, okay? So it's not these values that are Gaussian, but the sums or the averages are going to be distributed Gaussian. Okay, and that's, that's what the central limit theorem is saying. So the, the xi's, as long as they're independent, uh, identical, arbitrarily distributed, then their sum, which corresponds to the average or the sample means, is going to be Gaussian distributed. Okay, that's, that's the central limit theorem. Yeah? If the xi's yeah. aren't distributed normally, right. um, does variance still have a meaning? 
Uh, yeah, sure. Variance is just defined as expectation of x square. So it's a perfectly reasonable meaning. Yeah. So it's another question. Yes. Say that again. Say that again here. Here. Yeah, yeah, but the, I, this is the theorem according to this. If you want me to change the notation and put bars over here, be my guess. That's no problem. Okay. It's easy enough to do. Yes. Uh, are they, I'm sorry? Are they jointly Gaussian? Uh, that's not what the central limit theorem says. The central limit theorem says that there, the, the x1 bars are, can be as n goes to infinity, okay? And actually as the sample size goes to infinity, right? We're going to need that as well because of the, okay, then we're going to get that each, that the, the, this distribution is going to be Gaussian. But each one is not uh, at the jointly Gaussian. Well, we have to think of the random variables as joint distribution and I haven't come to that yet, so. Yeah, but that's not what the, limit, the theorem says, yeah. The example that you were given of heights. Yes. Suppose all x size are greater than equal to zero. I mean, they can't take negative. Sure, values. sure. So I mean, the minimum value of left hand side is like sort of minus n mu over sigma root n mean. Yes. Whereas right hand side is saying like it's 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 infinite support. Yeah. yeah. So the the uh, so the point you're making over here is that if these if the if these are uh, distributed according to the uh, any distribution would greater than equal to zero. Uh, right, so why is, okay, so, uh, okay, that's a good point. So the, the point is that if all the x1 bars are guaranteed to be positive, how can there sum, okay, so this minus n mu could be negative, yeah, right? It, it can't go minus infinity, yeah, well, the thing is that uh, if these are going to be, uh, let me see, so it can be negative, of course n is also tending to infinity, so it, could, it would go to, okay? otherwise the theorem would not be true. And uh, I didn't prove it, so it's, I know it's correct. <laughs> but for my theorem, I would have some doubts. Uh, <laughs> but no, this is a, I mean, uh, certainly this can be negative, there's no question about that because you have n mu. Okay. Uh, and n goes to infinity, so when n goes to infinity, then we can have the negative infinity, possibly. I mean, we could have a possibility that each of these xi's for some reason are all you know, zero, so something like that, and this n mu would still be very large, right? Negative n mu could be very large, so we could have very large negative value, so it's possible. Okay. Okay. Any other questions about this? Okay. So this is, as I said, the basis of uh, statistics in the following sense. I'll intuitively tell you what's going on, and, and, and the issue here is this. I, I, I compute uh, for a particular distribution or particular sample, I compute the mean and standard deviation, okay, and I compute that, right? And so th since this is, since this is normal, okay, I can have x, let's call that x bar bar to be the mean of these guys, okay. Remember x bar bar is a computed value, mu is the true value, okay. We don't know what mu is actually. Mu is the true population of all grad students, whatever, we don't really know what it is. But certainly I know the mean of the means, which is the mean of all these guys down here. And so the mean is going to be x bar bar. So we, we are basically approximating the distribution as x bar bar and it's going to be Gaussian, okay, with some spread given by, actually not sigma square, it will be given by, by something which looks like sigma square. Okay, again, it's an approximation of sigma square. The point I want to make is this. If I do this, then I can actually start doing the following thing. I can do this over here for, for grad students and I can do something else for, let's say, undergrad students, okay? And I can now say, what is the, what is the problem? Can I say that the heights of undergrads and grad students are statistically significantly different, okay? And we can do that by looking at sort of the overlap of these distributions, okay? So if this mean is going to have very low probability of being drawn from that distribution, then I can say they significantly differ, okay? Or let me make it more precise. Let's say that you work for a, a, a router vendor, okay? And the router vendor has got product A, and then two years later they come up and they say, oh, I have product B, and product B is much better, much faster. And if you have Firefox, for example, they say newer, faster Firefox, okay? I mean, every time you upgrade Firefox, it says newer, faster Firefox. 
it must be that the old stuff was really bad because it keep getting faster. So uh, anyway, so how do you know it's significantly faster? What you do is you compute for the old one the distribution over here. Okay, and we think we think that the reason why it's faster is because of many small independent errors being made in the measurement. So we get this. And then we take the newer one, we do this, and then we essentially say, would this mean value of the new one 